I'm Nicole Burley. It is Monday, August 16th. This is Rush Hour. Those top stories in just a moment. We do have hundreds of reporters spread across the country. This is a look at our News Nation network of stations. But tonight, the top story happening beyond our borders in Afghanistan. As the world watches the country devolving into chaos after the Taliban completes its takeover, one of the most dramatic scenes, thousands of Afghans flooding Kabul's main airport, desperately seeking a seat on any plane heading out of the country. We know at least seven people died in that chaos, including some who fell to their deaths after clinging to departing planes. Many Afghans who rushed onto the tarmac now left in limbo between American forces trying to push those people out of the airport and the surrounding Taliban trying to keep them in. And satellite images taken from above the airport show just how massive those crowds are, covering huge portions of the runways as people hoped for a spot on any flight leaving the country. And as foreign countries work to evacuate their own citizens, the focus now shifting to just how quickly the Taliban was able to sweep across the country. Early estimates warned the Afghan government could collapse within six months of the U.S. pullout. And less than a week ago, multiple major news outlets reporting Kabul could fall within 90 days. But now, just five days after those warnings, Kabul controlled by the Taliban and the international community left wondering exactly what went wrong and how. News Nation correspondent Joe Khalil live for us tonight in Fort Lee, that's in Virginia, where some Afghan interpreters landed after being evacuated earlier this summer. So Joe, please bring us up to speed on the day's developments. Well, the situation on the ground in Kabul is just horrific, Nicole. So the U.S. is focused on bringing Americans and evacuating those Afghans that have helped the United States out of the country and bring them to places like Fort Lee here, one of the first army bases that took in a trove of these Afghans that now hold special immigrant visa status here, and they plan to bring many more as the situation continues to deteriorate. Striking images from Kabul as U.S. forces and allies scramble to evacuate Americans and Afghans who helped the American war effort. Thousands of American troops trying to limit the chaos at Kabul's airport as Afghans desperate to flee the Taliban scaled walls, some even clinging to American planes. Taliban commanders now fully in control of the country speaking from the presidential palace, promising to remain peaceful despite the group's violent, suppressive past. We will give services to our nation. We will give serenity to the whole nation, that we will go as far as possible for the betterment of their lives. Kabul's mayor, Mohammed Sultanzoy, says in the absence of the Afghan government and security forces, he's now working with Taliban leaders to keep the city running. They want us to continue our a job and uh, provides um, our much needed service to the city of five million people, although the times are a little more um, anxious times, but uh, we have to do our job. Still, uncertainty and fear permeate Afghanistan. Government officials and police have fled. Women now question their future in a Taliban run nation. For sure, I'm afraid of myself, my life and my my freedom to work and my freedom to speak up. These are the things that I'm afraid, afraid of losing. Now, President Biden says there have been 2,000 Afghans evacuated to the United States already, just 700 in the past two days or so. And the Department of Defense says that pretty soon the U.S. will be able to take 5,000 Afghans per day, but they have to secure the airport in Kabul first to be able to do that. Nicole? Yeah, must secure that airport. All right, Joe, thank you. Well, tonight we are hearing from people trapped in Afghanistan, plus fresh fears of a terror attack as we approach the 20th anniversary of September 11th. But first, let's turn to News Nation White House correspondent Allison Harris. So, Allison, of course, the president just wrapped up his first speech on Afghanistan since the government collapsed. He's not backing down, though, from his decision to pull those troops. He's not, Nicole. Six weeks ago, President Biden said the Taliban takeover was not inevitable. Today, he flew from Camp David here to the White House to address the nation after the Taliban completed that takeover. The president defending himself, saying he stands squarely behind his decision to withdraw U.S. troops, saying the U.S. was in Afghanistan to prevent another 9-11 terrorist attack, never there to nation build. The president admitting that the situation in Afghanistan unfolded much faster than he 
he and the administration anticipated, but adding that he believes that no amount of military force or involvement in Afghanistan would have made the country stable, whether it were, as he says, five years ago or 15 years in the future. President Biden mentioning the deal that he inherited from former President Trump, which would have withdrawn U.S. troops back in May, saying that American troops cannot be fighting in a war that the Afghan forces aren't willing to fight themselves, accusing the Afghan forces of not having the political will to stop the Taliban. The president not taking any questions from the press after his remarks and also not backing down, saying that U.S. troops remaining in Afghanistan is not in the national security interest and it's not what the American people want. I stand squarely behind my decision. After 20 years, I've learned the hard way that there was never a good time to withdraw U.S. forces. This did unfold more quickly than we had anticipated. American troops cannot and should not be fighting in a war and dying in a war that Afghan forces are not willing to fight for themselves. And President Biden also in his remarks acknowledging the outrage that people are feeling that Americans and Afghan interpreters especially were not evacuated sooner. Thousands of Afghans who helped U.S. troops remain in Afghanistan at this time. The president saying that evacuations did not happen sooner because for one reason he said some of the Afghans did not want to leave their country, that they were hopeful for a better outcome against the Taliban. Even the president's own Democratic allies, some of them who agree with the withdrawal of U.S. troops, are expressing anger and frustration over the evacuation delays, saying that there were months to prepare for these evacuations. The president announced this back in April, saying that there should have been a more carefully planned, a more orderly transition to prevent the violence, the instability, and the chaos that we are now seeing in Kabul. Nicole? Well, Allison, of course, so the president just wrapping up that speech. What's the reaction that we're hearing from lawmakers and Republican leaders? Well, GOP leader Kevin McCarthy is calling the images that you saw earlier, those images of Afghans swarming the airport, clinging to planes, hoping to get out of Afghanistan, calling those damning. Uh, Mitch McConnell calling this a botched exit, saying that this is a shameful failure. McConnell this afternoon in Kentucky saying he hopes it's not too late for the president to put in enough troops in Afghanistan to at least get Americans and many of the Afghans who helped U.S. troops out of the country. Right now, there are, are, excuse me, not right now, but the U.S. is sending 6,000 troops to Kabul, to the airport there, to help with these evacuations. Nicole? Yeah, those images are tough to look at. All right. Allison, thank you. Well, as that chaos unfolds across the world in Afghanistan, there are, of course, renewed concerns of a terror threat here in the U.S., especially as, of course, we approach that 20 years since the September 11th attacks. News Nation correspondent Tom Nagavin is live for us tonight in New York. So, Tom, the Department of Homeland Security has issued a new warning. That's right, a relatively new warning as of last Friday, Nicole, a warning that seems more significant now to counterterrorism analysts and security experts who've been talking to us and uh, putting it into the perspective of what's going on in Afghanistan. They say it's definitely more interesting to them, the Taliban retaking control, giving more opportunity, they say, for terrorist groups like al-Qaeda to reconstitute in that country, posing potentially a threat to the homeland here as we approach that anniversary, two decades since the attack on America and the ceremonies that will be held to mark that anniversary here in Lower Manhattan at the Pentagon and at Shanksville, Pennsylvania. That bulletin issued late last week saying in part the 20th anniversary of the September 11, 2001 attacks was, as well, religious holidays. Uh, we assess could serve as a catalyst for acts of targeted violence. Now, it's important to point out there's no specific uh, or actionable intelligence there. No word of an imminent threat, just heightened caution as of this moment. And tonight there's also some dissent within the counterterrorism community around the country as to the significance of what's happening in Afghanistan and the timing of the American pullout from that country. But if there's no attacks on the homeland spawning from Afghanistan in three, five, ten years, I think we'll look back on it and say, you know, this was the, the right choice. Uh, and our, our presence there was actually achieving something. We were keeping the Taliban at bay and preventing al-Qaeda from reconstituting safe haven, keeping them on the run. And all of that will be undone now with our withdrawal. So I, I, I'm mystified why the president decided what he decided. 
The president, though, standing by what he decided, as you just heard from our Allison Harris at the White House. That Department of Homeland Security bulletin set to expire November the 11th, Veterans Day, but they're keeping an eye out for additional intelligence, they say, depending on the threat level. Nicole, DHS says it could be extended. All right, Tom, thank you. Well, our coverage of the ongoing unrest in Afghanistan continues tonight on rush hour. At the bottom of the hour, we're turning our focus to how women in the country are bracing for the return of strict Taliban rule, plus how U.S. troops who fought in Afghanistan are reacting to this Taliban takeover. All right, we are talking weather now. Chief Meteorologist Albert Ramon live for us in the Weather Center. Albert, you are tracking Fred and actually a tropical trio tonight. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is the busiest we've been all hurricane season. We have Fred that made landfall during the 2 o'clock hour central time in the panhandle of Florida. But let me show you the Atlantic Basin. We also have Grace not too far from Haiti in the Dominican Republic and newly formed Andre, which is just off towards the southeast of Bermuda. We'll kind of do a loop-de-loop -loop around Bermuda and not a threat to the United States. More on Grace in a second. Let me show you the latest on Fred. This is a tropical storm, 60 mile per hour winds, tornado watches, flash flood watches in effect from the panhandle of Florida stretching northward into portions of Georgia as well as Alabama. Big rainmaker the next two days as it'll be pretty close to the community, to the city, I should say, of Atlanta. And eventually by the time we head into Wednesday, we'll be around West Virginia, anywhere from one to five inches of rainfall. Up to 10 to 12 inches of rainfall in Haiti, hard hit Haiti as we reported the earthquake ongoing uh, rescue efforts there with the earthquake mudslides rock slides likely as grace moves off towards the west northwest right around Cancun as we head towards Thursday and then early in the weekend as a category one hurricane impacting Mexico we'll keep an eye on all three for you Nicole all right, thank you, Albert. Well, we do want to talk about Haiti now. Charities and other humanitarian organizations heading up relief efforts in the island nation. Of course, that earthquake, talking about Fred hitting. News Nation correspondent Brian Enton is live in Miami's little Haiti neighborhood. So, Brian, what are some of the steps those groups are taking? Yeah, here in Little Haiti right now, Nicole, there are several organizations. They are basically scrambling right now to gather as much aid, raise as much money as they can, and to get it to Haiti very, very quickly because uh, we've all seen the images. It's just a terrible, terrible uh, situation there right now. More than a thousand people dead. They say it's especially tricky right now when it comes to aid, though, because of the political situation in Haiti. You remember uh, the prime minister, the president, was murdered there uh, just last month, and they say they have to be careful about which organizations they partner with on aid right now because there's just so much corruption. And on top of all of that, you heard Albert just mention uh, that they're dealing with a tropical depression right now, expecting, to five, expecting five to ten inches of rain. The organizations here uh, already said that that's impacting some of the relief flights that they had planned. A lot of people are crying for help under the robbers, but unfortunately they don't have the means to really help them. So we don't have many rescuers on the ground, and especially also we are facing that uh, tropical depression. And there was uh, one JetBlue flight that was able to get out yesterday full of aid. It did make it uh, to Haiti before uh, the weather turned there. And we know that the Coast Guard also has several of their helicopters there throughout the day. Despite the weather, they've been transporting uh, very, very uh, sick people who were under the rubble, taking them to the capital city so they can get to the hospital. Nicole? All right, Brian, thank you. Help very much needed. And if you'd like to contribute to the humanitarian efforts in Haiti, you can head to NewsNationNow.com. There we've compiled a list of re reputable charities accepting donations. And we know right now the death toll sitting at at least 1,400 from that earthquake. You can also find a list on uh, our News Nation Now app. And we will check in live in Haiti coming up. Well, still ahead on a rush hour, new concerns tonight over another COVID-19 variant. What we know about the Lambda variant and how health experts are scrambling to contain it.
As Albert told you, tonight tropical depression Grace is expected to bring heavy rain and the chance of flooding and mudslides in Haiti, where thousands of people are sleeping in the streets after their homes were destroyed by that weakened earthquake. Now, search and rescue continues with a current death toll of at least 1,400 people. News Nation's Hawker Vanguard from our station WJZY is live in Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince. So, Hawker, you're there on the ground. What are things like right now? Well, here in the capital city of Port-au-Prince, things are still dire on the streets, even 10 years after that deadly quake here in the capital city. And they're trying to pull all the medical, humanitarian, and just shelter supplies they can send to Lakai. But obviously, Tropical Depression Grace has put a very large damper on that, halting flights to that area from Port-au-Prince this afternoon as well as medical help that's going that way and those medevac patients who are being brought from Lakai here to the larger hospitals where they've seen hundreds of patients just today alone. All right, so Hawker, you mentioned their tropical depression, Grace. Um, what type of impact are they anticipating? Well, right now, we, like I said, we've seen a, a halt of those flights and uh, as well as we mentioned earlier, flights coming from the mainland United States with those humanitarian aids and uh, those humanitarian items being brought here. Most importantly, things related to drinking water. We're surrounded by ocean here, a lot of salinated water, but so many water factories and water plants that are mobile being brought here from the United States that aren't able to make it because of this storm sitting in the way. As it sits right now, Grace is just tracking off the coast of Haiti headed west at a very slow pace. So it's going to be a very wet night for everybody sleeping on the streets this evening here in Haiti as a result of that devastating earthquake. Yeah, so much help needed there. Hawker Vanguard live on the ground for us in Port-au-Prince. Thank you. All right, well, let's get you back to that new COVID variant making its way across the U.S. So far, at least 44 states have identified the Lambda variant. First identified in South America, researchers say this new mutation could be even more infectious and more resistant to the antibodies produced by vaccines here in the U.S. News Nation's Marky Martin joining us live from Dallas tonight. So, Marky, what do we know about this Lambda variant? Yeah. Hey, Nicole, good to join you here this afternoon. I will say off the top, the Delta variant does remain the prevalent variant. However, Lambda is now starting to emerge and just kind of a, a caveat right off the top. So little is known about this strain. Most importantly, how contagious it is and also the severity of the illness it can cause. It should surprise nobody that we are going to continue to have further evolution of this virus into other variants. Just as the U.S. is beginning to backtrack due to the Delta variant, a new strain is starting to emerge, Lambda. So it is here in Louisiana. We do not know whether this is going to be better, worse, different, the same. In Delta, there's not enough information. According to the World Health Organization, Lambda was first discovered in Peru last year. Since April, it's been responsible for more than 80% of cases reported there. It's now taken over other parts of South America, including Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, Argentina, Brazil, and now 44 American states have reported Lambda cases. Two recent studies that have yet to be peer reviewed out of New York and Japan found Lambda to be more infectious than older versions of coronavirus and more resistant to vaccination antibodies. So now Lambda's coming, it's definitely more infectious and we may not be protected from it. Many doctors maintaining the COVID vaccine is effective against Lambda and still remains your best chance at protection. Every person who's unvaccinated uh, is really a little incubator for developing a new variant. Now, here in Texas, the Lambda strain was found for the first time last month at a Houston hospital. Since then, there are now five known cases here out of the Dallas area alone. But I will say, you know, globally, the spread of Lambda has been significant enough for the World Health Organization to label it uh, a variant of interest. Nicole. Well, Mark, and of course, we know that the, that the virus will continue to evolve. And today, Pfizer submitting data to the FDA for authorization of a COVID booster. And this is for the general population, not just for the immunocompromised. 
Yeah, so Pfizer making this announcement this morning that they're looking into a booster shot for everybody ages 16 and older, not just those who are immunocompromised. So they just submitted data. They just finished um, phase one clinical trial. And I do want to share this. They found that a booster dose of vaccine generated, quote, word on word here, uh, significantly higher neutralizing antibodies against the original coronavirus strain plus the beta and delta variants. Interesting, though, no mention of Lambda there uh, today. But at this time, we can tell you federal health experts are, are only recommending a booster shot for those with weakened immune systems, not the general population as of this time. Nicole. All right, not the general pop. All right, Marky, thank you. Well, first, for the country, New Yorkers wanting to eat out, go to museums, theaters, bars, or other indoor businesses will have to prove they are vaccinated. This new requirement starts tomorrow, and News Nation's James Ford with our New York station WPIX will break down where the rules apply and how it will be enforced. Now, the idea is to get more people vaccinated by barring unvaccinated people from places like this bar and restaurant. But with this come controversy and confusion. Proof of vaccination required for indoor service at this restaurant and bar, as well as at gyms and other fitness facilities and live theaters and movie theaters. Today was the day everyone was prepared for the requirement to begin, but Mayor Bill de Blasio made a clarification. We said the week of August 16th and we needed to just get a few more of the fine tunings going there, put everything out there, start it formally tomorrow. Did the pathogen clock out today and it's clocking in tomorrow? She's one of a few dozen protesters against the vaccination mandate. These demonstrators say the mandate's not only confusing, it's wrong. Now, most people we've encountered over the last few weeks have either favored or said they didn't mind the vaccine mandate. They also said that there are plenty of outdoor options for unvaccinated people, at least until it gets cold out a few months down the road. Reporting from New York City, I'm James Ford. Back to you, Nicole. All right, James, thank you. We'll still ahead tonight on Rush Hour as the Taliban completes its takeover of Afghanistan. Women in the country bracing for a return to strict Islamic law. We're hearing from a mother whose children are trapped in Kabul, and she's holding out hope they're able to escape. Plus, MLB star Trevor Bauer back in court, along with the woman accusing him of sexual assault. Welcome back. Let's get you caught up on the breaking news out of Afghanistan. Turmoil following the Taliban takeover of Kabul. Thousands of Afghans rushing onto the tarmac at the main airport, desperate to escape their homeland after the collapse of the government. Seven people falling to their deaths, clinging to an American military jet as it took off. Witnesses say hundreds of people remain trapped as American forces try to push them out of the airport, but Taliban forces working to keep them in. All flights, both military and civilian, suspended until that runway can be cleared. We've learned the airfield, though, has reopened less than an hour ago. And militants patrolled Kabul today, exerting their control over the city of five million people, prompting that mass exodus, the capture of the capital city, and the collapse of the government happening at shocking speeds. The Taliban taking just a week to seize power as the U.S. prepares to complete troop withdrawal by the end of the month. And this afternoon, President Biden addressing the nation, defending his decision and promising retaliation if the Taliban disrupts the U.S. mission to safely remove personnel. How many more generations of America's daughters and sons would you have me send to fight Afghans Afghanistan's civil war? And Afghan troops will not. How many more lives, American lives, is it worth? How many endless rows of headstones at Arlington National Cemetery? I'm clear on my answer. I will not repeat the mistakes we've made in the past. 
The president also promising the U.S. will continue supporting the Afghan people and push for diplomacy in the region. All right, let's bring in On Balance anchor Leland Vittert, who was stationed in the region for years. So, Leland, we want your perspective tonight. A possible takeover predicted to take 90 days took less than a week after that 20-year American presence. So tell us, how did things go so wrong so quickly? Well, slowly and then very quickly, Nicole. And that's part of the problem here is that the Afghan army, 300,000 men trained, equipped, and paid by the United States, literally just melted away. So the United States was hoping to turn Afghanistan over to the Afghans, but the Afghan military just folded, oftentimes without firing a shot. So the Taliban took over with this stunning speed. And as early as Friday of last week, we were being told that there was no threat to Kabul. And the people in Kabul believed there was no threat to Kabul because they were counting on the Afghan army to protect them. That all disintegrated over the weekend. And now you have what you see on your screen, which is tens of thousands of people who know what the Taliban rule means trying to get out. Absolutely disintegrated. And of course, we heard from the president today addressing the nation. Now, Leland, is there a way to be proactive and maybe turn things around, at least attempt to turn things around? Or at this point, is it really just too late and it all has to be reactionary? Or are we just done? Well, back when I was in the Middle East, we used to have a saying that I have two choices, both of which are bitter. And that's what President Biden faces. And he laid it out. And to answer your question directly, sure, you could turn this around tomorrow. You could reinvade Afghanistan with a couple of hundred thousand U.S. troops. You could start using U.S. air power to bomb the Taliban back to the Stone Age and all of their positions because it's a bunch of guys running around uh, in rags, as you've seen them, uh, carrying weapons and terrorizing people in Hilux pickups. So sure, you could, you could turn this around tomorrow uh, at what cost, which would probably be thousands of American lives and we'd go through this whole thing all over again as two U.S. presidents, really three U.S. presidents, have in the past. And in a year, we'd probably be right back where we started with an Afghan military that you can't turn the country over to and with a Taliban that is continuing to kill American soldiers. So the president made the decision as the commander in chief, which is as humiliating as these pictures are. Uh, effectively, there's no elegant way to end a war. You, know, you think about Dunkirk, for example, the British a retreat from the shores of France. Uh, they made a movie about it because it was so terrible and awful. And probably in future, people will look back at this and say, this was a terrible and awful day for the United States, a terrible and awful week for the United States. But there wasn't going to be some you know, parade from the U.S. Embassy to the airport so everybody could get on the plane and, and head off into the sunset. That's not the way these things work uh, when you lose a war. Yeah, excellent perspective. Thank you, Lena. Of course, you'll have much more Afghanistan coverage coming up tonight on On Balance. Well, the U.N. is calling the humani this a humanitarian crisis with the Taliban takeover, of course, leaving thousands of refugees in need. News Asians Felicia Bolton joining us now with that part of the story. And Felicia, the fear is that this means brutal laws enforced, especially for women and children. Nicole, that's right. In some provinces, Taliban fighters have already forced women to wear burqas and have men escort them on their daily errands. It's a return to strict requirements the Taliban militants put in place prior to 9-11. And right Right now, about 20,000 Afghans who work alongside U.S. forces are expected to apply for a special visa to live right here in the U.S. But for many refugees already in America, the race to rescue their families is not happening fast enough. It's every mother's worst fear, seeing their child in danger. I am worried for my children's safety because the Taliban is taking over. Sunita is an Afghan refugee living in New York. Her four children are in Kabul, trying to escape as the Taliban takes control ahead of the U.S. and NATO withdrawal. Out of fear for her life, she's asked us not to use her last name. Everyone is running away from the Kabul city and trying to get out of the country. But they are unsupervised kids by themselves, all alone in an apartment, and are really scared and afraid because of Taliban coming in. 
Right now, thousands of Afghan people are fighting or fleeing in fear of the return to strict Taliban rule, marked with violence against children, women, and ethnic cleansing of minorities. Sunita says she already lost her husband to the Taliban. Now she waits to see the fate of her young children. They've heard the horror stories of them taking girls or taking people whose families used to work with the U.S. I'm very worried. I didn't sleep all night. I was up all night talking with them. And right now, several Western countries are working to evacuate their nationals from the fallen nation, while many Afghan people are just desperate to catch a military plane to safety. Nicole. Yeah, absolute desperation. All right, Felicia, thank you. Well, now we want to bring you one of the stories of a family struggle to escape. News Nation's Vicente Arenas from our Denver station KDVR is live for us tonight. So, Vicente, you spoke to a Colorado man. He's trapped on the ground there in Afghanistan. And as we've seen, there is no clear way out. And Nicole, you could hear the desperation in this man's voice as I spoke to him. He's in Kabul trying to figure out how he's going to get home. He described walking to the airport miles through masses of people and then being met with mayhem and gunfire. He sent us some video that he shot while he was there. You could see all those people. You could hear the gunfire. He's trying so desperately to try to get his wife and his two children home. He, so far, they do not think they'll be able to come. They're scheduled to return on August 28th, but there are so many problems. Harun is from the Denver area, worked in the mass transportation system here, had gone back to Afghanistan to visit with his parents and his wife's parents, but now they're not sure when they'll be able to come back because they have lost all communication with their airline and the embassy. We're really worrying here and kind of scared as well, so we can we can uh, we don't we can trust anyone and since Taliban and stuff like that. And now people are getting crazy because everything's out of control for the government. So many things out of control. We are now working with our state's lawmakers to try and see if we can try to make sure that Harun and his family return safely here to Colorado. Reporting live from right outside Denver, Vicente Adonis for News Nation. Nicole. Excellent reporting as always, Vicente, thank you. Well, now to our soldiers, veterans who served in Afghanistan, dealing with this roller coaster of emotions as they watched the Taliban undo 20 years of work. Matt Morrow joining us live now. So, Matt, you have reaction from veterans all across the nation. And as you can imagine, Nicole, they have a lot to say tonight. We're hearing from the vets from all across the country who risked their lives and served in this nearly 20-year war in Afghanistan. And they have all different thoughts about this. We'll take you through a few of them right now. Let's start with Farley Ferguson. He served three tours between Afghanistan and Iraq. He tells us the U.S. stayed far too long trying to build a nation there. We should have never tried to establish the nation we should have never tried to build their army. We should have just went in, done what we were supposed to do, get Osama bin Laden off the top of Tora Bora, and leave. Part of you feels like it's a waste of time, but as long as Afghanistan can come together and be a stronger participant in the world, then it'll be worth it. Ferguson says this is no longer America's fight. He thinks it's something the Afghan people need to take care of as they're trying to right now. Meanwhile, Angel Guma says the withdrawal leaves the country quite vulnerable. But when he was serving in Afghanistan, he had some hope. I really have to say it was a waste of time to begin with. If it wasn't nation building, then what was it? Now, there are other veterans who are downright angry tonight. This includes Tom Amenta. He's from Chicago, is a former Army Ranger and the co-author of the book, The 20-Year War. That book highlights the lives of veterans reeling from two decades of fighting. And while American troops are leaving Afghanistan right now, he thinks they'll eventually be back. I, I cannot express enough how angry I am ultimately at the thought of knowing that my friends, sons, and daughters will put night vision down over their eyes and walk into what I walked into in 2002. And at the end of the day, we've had four administrations, two Republican, two Democrat, no one quite solved it, but to try and throw this on your predecessor, to try and, it's just spin, it's just noise, it's just the thing that politicians do to cover their butts. Some veterans have now made their way from Afghanistan to Washington, D.C., and are some of America's leaders. Congressman Jack Auchincloss is one of them. He represents Massachusetts. He echoed what President Joe Biden talked about just a short time ago, that the counterterrorism aspect of the war in Afghanistan is successful. But as far as any kind of a political partnership in Kabul, he says that leaves a lot to be desired. 
what we have seen in the last 48 hours is a sudden takeover by the Taliban of Afghanistan. But the counterinsurgency effort has been going bankrupt gradually for 20 years now. The congressman, who is a Democrat, also says pulling out of Afghanistan can free up the U.S. to focus on other threats such as climate change and public health. So as you can see, Nicole, there are a lot of conflicting emotions about this rapid withdrawal. Yes, yeah, so important, though, to hear from those veterans. All right, Matt, thank you. Let's still ahead tonight on Rush Hour. Dodgers star pitcher Trevor Bauer back in court today. A judge deciding whether to extend a temporary restraining order against the Cy Young winner. Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher Trevor Bauer is fighting back against accusations of battery. Bauer currently on leave from the team and in civil court today. He contested a restraining order obtained by a woman who's accusing him of beating her during two sexual encounters. Nancy, News Nation's Nancy Liu is live from L.A. Superior Court. So, Nancy, we know you've been in court all day. What was the judge's decision? Well, this hearing is ongoing because the judge ruled that it should proceed. So in recent weeks, Trevor Bauer has spent more time inside this courthouse than at Dodger Stadium. This morning, the judge dis, uh, refused to, he denied uh, Bauer's request to drop the restraining order against him. The 2020 Cy Young winner has been on leave since July 2nd, and today Trevor Bauer was back in court to fight a temporary restraining order filed by a San Diego woman. She's been testifying about two consensual encounters in April and May, which she claims led to sexual assault. Her testimony follows a weekend report by the Washington Post, revealing a similar case against Bauer in Ohio when he pitched for Cleveland in 2017. A young woman had also filed a restraining order after Bauer allegedly beat her during sex and then sent threatening messages. 11 strikeouts for Trevor Bauer. Cleveland traded Bauer to Cincinnati before he landed his current three-year, $102 million contract with the Dodgers. In an extensive weekend tweet, Bauer and his reps fought back against the report, claiming the Ohio woman had tried to extort him for millions. Investigations are ongoing by the MLB and the Pasadena Police Department, which is considering possible criminal charges. Despite all the off-field drama, some are not counting Bauer out yet. If he's exonerated, um, you know, I, I don't really see uh, anything other than, you know, a slight PR hill for teams to have to get over. Uh, we, we've unfortunately seen worse. And um, as long as he's cleared of any wrongdoing legally, he's probably going to be in the clear to rejoin a club at some point. Now, Bauer's latest accuser has been on the stand for most of the day and admitted early on that she is a recovering alcoholic with an ego and attention problem. Bauer's attorney has yet to cross-examine, and due to a possible criminal case, Bauer is expected to invoke the fifth if he is called to testify here. Nicole? All right, Nancy, we know you'll be keeping an eye on it. Thank you. The still ahead tonight on Rush Hour, check up some of the top stories making headlines around your nation, including the autopsy report released in the police shooting death of an Ohio teen. We continue tonight live from our News Nation headquarters here in Chicago. Here's a look at what's going on in your nation right now. Crisis in Afghanistan, people struggling to escape. After the Taliban seizes control of the capital, at least seven people died at the main airport in Kabul, many trying desperately to grab onto those departing planes. At the White House, President Biden addressing the nation, defending the decision to pull U.S. troops out of Afghanistan, saying American troops cannot continue fighting a war that the Afghan forces are not willing to fight. Tropical Storm Fred has made landfall in Florida's Gulf Coast. The storm dumping lots of rain on the area, bringing the chance of flash flooding. Currently, Fred has winds of about 65 miles per hour. It is heading northeast. That storm expected to impact Georgia early tomorrow morning through the end of the day. And the death toll from that powerful earthquake in Haiti has risen to more than 1,400 people. 6,000 others are injured. 
rescue and recovery crews working feverishly to help as many people as possible. Of course, as tropical depression grace makes landfall on the island, Haitian officials say some areas could get as much as 15 inches of rain. And we do have an update about the Makai Bryant story. The 16-year-old girl shot and killed by a Columbus, Ohio police officer back in April. Well, now the coroner ruling her death a homicide, but that's not a criminal ruling. It does mean, though, her death was caused by another person. And this body cam video showing the teen wielding a knife just before that officer shot her four times. In New York, a corrections officer's protest outside Rikers Island today over what they describe as dangerous working conditions. Complaints include triple shifts and increased violence against officers. But a corrections spokesperson tells News Nation that protest was not a walkout of on-duty guards. And a water crisis in the western part of the U.S., Lake Mead currently at its lowest level ever. That lake, of course, created by the Hoover Dam. It's the largest reservoir in the country. But with the extreme drought out west, it's now putting water supplies and energy resources in jeopardy. Lake Mead is the water source for roughly 40 million Americans. Right now, it has dropped 140 feet. An investigation has been launched into Tesla's advanced driver assistance. U.S. auto safety regulators examining the company's autopilot system after at least 11 crashes at emergency scenes, mostly after dark. Tesla has not responded to a request for comment, but has long said driving with autopilot engaged is safer than doing so without it. Well, a busy and difficult night for so many in this country and around the world. We do appreciate your time tonight. That is all for Rush Hour, but our coverage does continue all night. Next up, the Dolan Report with Adrian Bankert on the desk tonight. Then later, On Balance with Leland Vittert, News Nation Prime with Marty Hughes and Banfield. Okay. And you can follow me on social media. Just search Nicole Burley on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, okay. and download our free News Nation Now app.